Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. You wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Exodus. The Old Testament book of Exodus in Exodus and chapter number 7. Exodus and chapter number 7. We are continuing with the life and ministry of Moses and walking with Moses. And where we had left Moses off is that God had sent Moses to go confront Pharaoh. And the results were not what Moses expected. And so Moses went back and the people were upset at Moses because Pharaoh had made their life harder. And Moses needed uh, (laughs) to cry it out and he was upset with God. And God pulled Moses aside and revealed to Moses more about who God was. Now with Moses recharged, now with a clear vision of God, God sends Moses back to Pharaoh. This time with Moses having the confidence of who God is. And he's going to be responding to Pharaoh differently, even if Pharaoh is still the same with his responses. So pick it up with me if you don't mind. To the book of Exodus in chapter number 1. Or 7. Exodus chapter number 7. Starting at verse number 1. The book of Exodus chapter 7 and verse 1. The Bible says this. And the Lord said unto Moses. See I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. And Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee. And Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh that he should send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, where when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt to bring out the children of Israel from among them. And Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them, so did they. And Moses was fourscore years old, and Aaron was fourscore and three years old, when they spake unto Pharaoh. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, as they did so, as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent." Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuseth to let the people go. Get thee unto Pharaoh in the morning. Lo, he goeth out unto the water. Thou shalt stand by the river's brink against he come. And the rod which was turned into a serpent shalt thou take in thine hand. And thou shalt say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. Behold, here hitherto thou wouldest not hear. Thus saith the Lord, In this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite the rod which is in mine hand upon the waters which are 
in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that is in the river shall die, and the river shall stink. And the Egyptians shall loathe to drink of the water of the river. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch out thy hand upon the waters of Egypt, and upon their streams, and upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood." that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in the vessels of wood and the vessels of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod and smote the waters which were in the river, and the sight of Pharaoh, and in the sight of all his servants, and all the water that was in the river were turned to blood. And all the fish that were in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river, and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house. Neither did he set his heart to this also. And all the Egyptians digged round about the river for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the river. And seven days were fulfilled after that the Lord had smitten the river. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that's repeated in a couple different ways throughout this passage? But notice with me in Exodus chapter 7 and verse number 14. Exodus chapter 7 and verse 14. Notice the phrase, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. Pharaoh's heart is hardened. And with the Lord's help, we want to see this idea here that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God. And as we hit this passage here, we're asking that the principle would be clear, that it would be easily understood, that we can understand where this hardness of heart came from. We can understand the purpose of it. We can understand that you're a God that's always in control. I'm so thankful for whom you are. I'm just asking that you would open up this passage with much power, that we may see who you are through it all. Again, the best I know how, I surrender myself even now. And I beg that you fill me with your spirit. Please, you do the work. You do the message. And you get your own work accomplished through your precious word. Thank you that we can trust you and your word. In your name we pray. Amen. This here, this passage here, is a very troublesome passage for a lot of folks. Because... They want to understand theologically, how does this work? What is God getting accomplished, and what does this do for us? Well, if you don't mind, we like to take this historically and then apply it uh, to philosophically and practically in our life as we examine this. The first thing I'd like to show you here is that Pharaoh's heart was hardened with the rods. Pharaoh's heart was hardened with the rods. What we see here is Pharaoh is the king of Egypt. He is put in bondage, in slavery, all of the children of Israel. And God has sent his man Moses to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And he had a couple different signs that he, that God wanted Moses to do to try to get Pharaoh's attention that God was a real God. Notice with me, starting at verse number 7, that Pharaoh's heart was hardened with the rods. Notice with me in verse 7. And Moses was fourscore years old. So now we're getting the picture of how old he is. Again, sometimes people paint different pictures. Remember, a score is 20, and so fourscore would be four times 20, which would be 80. And Aaron would be fourscore and three years, so Four times 20 plus 3 would be 83. So we're not talking about a spring chicken. We're talking about someone here who is 80 years old when he goes to do God's work. When he is sent to stand before Pharaoh. And Moses was four score years old and Aaron was four score and three years old when they spake unto Pharaoh. And the Lord spake unto Moses unto Aaron saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you saying, Show a miracle for you, then 
Thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so. As the Lord had commanded, and Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before the serpents, and it became or servants, and it became a serpent. So here it is. Moses gets another audience with Pharaoh. And Pharaoh looks at him, What do you want this time? Didn't I already tell you no? And Moses said, Well, the God of the Hebrews says, Let my people go. And Pharaoh, in the midst of the conversation, says, Huh. What power does your God have? Remember, that's what we had covered before, that Pharaoh was being asked by the God of the slaves to someone who was considered a God to let the slaves go. And his idea was, who is that God to tell me what to do? So when Moses steps in this time around, Pharaoh just asked him, Prove to me, show me that your God is real. And so he gives the request. Moses says, all right, let me show you something. Aaron, throw down your rod. And he throws down the rod and it becomes a serpent. Now remember when Moses was outside the burning bush and God said, throw down your rod. Moses threw down his rod, it turned to a serpent and he took off. And probably the normal response. But here's Pharaoh, who's considered a god, who's been battle-hardened. And when Moses throws down the rod and it turns into a serpent, Pharaoh looks at him and says, so? So? It's no big deal. He goes to his magicians, and that's what the Bible calls them later on in the New Testament, where it talks about these wise men. Usually in the Bible, when you see the wise men in the Old Testament since uh, the Babylonians and whatever else, these would be their magicians, their, their uh, <coughs> workers of curious arts, these followers of the occult. And may I also put a little asterisk here and remind you that Satan is real, and Satan does have power. Now, it pales in comparison to God, but Satan does have power. And I would like to think, or it would be more than logical to think, that Satan was very much interested in these proceedings. And so, Pharaoh just looked steel, didn't flinch, didn't look, and didn't, is that all you got? And he looked to his magicians and says, show them, boys. And notice what they do. It says, in verse number 11, then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt, they also in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. So, let me remind you that they didn't have any prep time. They didn't say, time out. Let me see if we could duplicate this. Pharaoh said, do it now. And the magicians repeated the same thing. Without practice, without knowing what was going to happen. They were prepared. Satan is a great imitator. And that's a principle you need to know. Satan imitates God's work often. Satan always tries to imitate God's work. And this is why we have to be very discerning about the things that happen in God's work and what happens in different churches because Satan's a good imitator. And he would love to fool people by imitating God's work and distracting them from looking at God. And so, Pharaoh just looked and said, no. Now, what we see is, we're seeing Pharaoh. Did Pharaoh have any desire to obey God? Nope. What he was doing was looking for justification of why he was not going to obey. Oh, any magician could do that trick. Show them, boys. You can imagine some of them were probably sweating. We got to repeat this. Okay, and so they do. And I don't believe it was necessarily of them. I do believe Satan had a hand in this. But they repeated this. And Pharaoh says, see, your God's not that tough. Your God's not that amazing. Our gods are just as real. And his heart was hardened. Notice this, if you don't mind, in verse 13. And he, who's that he there? God. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And he hearkened, Pharaoh hearkened on unto them as the Lord said. Now this is where people start to have a little bit of theological problems. They said, but, but 
God hardened it. Pharaoh had no choice of the matter. Yes, Pharaoh had a choice. Pharaoh had already decided he was not going to obey God. God is responding to that already desire that he was not going to obey God. And so it's actually building on it. It's making it worse. But Pharaoh already had no desire. It's already been shown he had no desire. He was looking for a reason not to obey. Now, we... It has been an interesting study. Through this whole year, we have the theme, with God, all things are possible. But underlying in the current of this theme, parallel, that when we see this idea, with God, all things are possible, we see in the current underneath it, this idea of hardening heart. We saw this in the Elijah and Elisha series. We saw this all throughout the the gospel record of Mark. This idea of hardening hearts. Now we come to one of the passages that deal with the biggest miracles that God has ever done before man, before a wide spectacle audience of the Egyptians with the plagues. With God all things are possible. But underlying in the current was once again this repeated theme, this hardened heart. Now, once again, because we've covered it before, I want to give you the reminder. Where does a hardened heart come from? A hardened heart comes when someone refuses to respond properly to God. That any time, any time you don't respond properly to God, your heart hardens just a bit more. And 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 just a bit more. Until it is stone. Until it's at the place where it will not be moved. Unless God breaks that heart. And what happens to people. Is it's a small disobedience. A small disobedience. A small disobedience. A small disobedience. And then those small disobedience build up. Any time. And every time. God's word is preached and you don't respond properly, your heart hardens more every time. Now, what I'm doing is I'm giving the best people in the world, church people, this warning. Your heart hardens every time you do not respond properly to God's word. That is why the most important part of an entire church service is is the invitation. The invitation is your decision. What am I going to do in response to what God has given me? And your response is this. I will say yes to God. Or I will not say yes to God. We'll cover this a little bit more later. But I'm explaining where a hardened heart comes from. It is the failure to respond to God's word when it is given. And the proper response is... Yes, 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 Lord, you are right. I am wrong. I will do what you say. And so someone could be a good person sitting in a church for 30 years and their hearts harden because they've never responded to God. They've never taken the step and it's just getting hard and hard and hard. As we stop responding to God, our heart begins to get hardened more And more and more. Pastors, as they stop, pastors need preaching too. But as pastors stop growing and they stop responding to God, their hearts become hardened and hardened and hardened. And we all have seen in the past, unfortunately, some pastors, when they were young, they were straight and narrow. But later on, they fell and other stuff. What happened? Their hearts become to get hardened, no longer tender towards the Lord, they stop saying yes, and it starts to build up bit by bit by bit. That's where a hardened heart comes from. And so when you take those two themes parallel to each other, you are going to have a tender heart because you've said yes, 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 and you get to the place where you're crazy enough to believe with God all things are possible. Amen. Or... You start saying no to God and no to God and no to God. And now you're at the place where you don't believe God could do anything. These are the two responses, two reactions that come from one place. What, how do I respond to God's word 
when it's given. The more that you respond to God, the more that you'll be able to believe with God all things are possible. The more that you fail to respond, you begin to develop a hardened heart that will not respond to God and will not listen when God speaks and has a heart of unbelief. This is where Pharaoh is at. His heart is hardened and God is adding more hardness to it. You say, why? We'll get to that here in a bit. But here's the first one. Let my people go. No. Why should I obey your God? Well, let me show you what God can do. And throws down his staff. It becomes a serpent. He stands there staring at him. So. Gets his magicians to repeat it and say, your God's not that big. I don't have to respond to him. He's not doesn't impress me any. Well. Wouldn't that for most people? Wouldn't that kind of make you kind of scratch your head? And say, well, you know, maybe there's something to this. I've never seen that before. So we see, first of all, that Pharaoh's heart was hardened with the rods. The second thing that we see here is that Pharaoh's heart was hardened with the blood. Pharaoh's heart was hardened with the blood. Notice with me in verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuseth to let the people go. Get thee into Pharaoh in the morning. And lo, he goeth out to the water. And thou shalt stand by the river's brink against he come. And the rod which was turned to a serpent shall thou take in thy hand. And thou shalt say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, Hitherto thou wouldest not hear. Thus saith the Lord, in this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod which is in my hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that is in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall load to drink of the water of the river. And the Lord spake unto Moses, said, Say unto Aaron, Take out thy rod. And so here it is Moses and Aaron are told to catch Pharaoh in the morning when he's getting ready to take his bath. So he's going out to the Nile River. He's going to wash himself. And then someone says, Oh, here they come. And he looks and oh, it's Moses and Aaron again. So he's trying to take a bath. He's trying to go get clean. Now these two guys come up and say, Listen, God still wants you to let his people go. We already went over this. Your God doesn't have power. Oh yeah? Watch this. And they take the rod and they put it over the river. The Nile River. And a miraculous thing happens is that it turns to blood. Now some of the Bible deniers jump on this and they say, You understand that there's a certain type of red algae that's in the sea. And when it hits just right and the algae blossoms a little bit, it turns all the water into a red bloody color. When the Bible says that the water turned to blood, it's not speaking in figurative language. And just to prove it, it said not just the water that's in the river, but the ponds. It even says the vessels. So someone who doesn't know what's going on, the dad says, kids, give me something to drink. And so the kids go and they grab a pitcher of water from where they were keeping it and they pour it into a glass and it's blood. What just happened here? Well, they take another vessel and all right, and it's blood. Every piece of water that they have has turned to blood. All throughout Egypt. People that don't even know what's going on all of a sudden. People who are in fishing in the Nile River. It turns to blood. Those that are farming and are irrigating their fields with the water from the Nile. It's turned into blood. Everything has turned to blood. This doesn't just affect Pharaoh. This affects all of the land of Egypt. Notice again in verse 19. And the Lord spake unto Moses, say unto Aaron, take thy rod and stretch out thy hand upon the waters of Egypt and upon their streams and upon their rivers and upon their ponds and upon the pools of water that they may become blood, that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in the vessels of wood and the vessels of stone. So even the things that were set aside for drink and for watering uh, animals and for watering themselves is all turned into blood. 
Verse 20, And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded. And he lifted the rod and smoked the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh, and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. And the fish that were in the river died. And the river stank. And the Egyptians could not drink of the water uh, of the river. And there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Now this is important because the life of Egypt is the Nile River. That the Nile River helps keep Egypt alive. Remember that Egypt is found in the Sahara Desert. It is hot. There's not a lot of moisture. But the Nile River is the one that gives all of Egypt its life. Life and civilization could not have been found it there in Egypt without the Nile. Every year the Nile would overflow its banks. And as it did, it would leave heaps of, uh, of, um, <coughs> of riverbed Upon the soil. And that's what they would use to plant their crops. This is how they would survive. Without the Nile River flooding. They could not have the crops for that year. They could not survive. This is where all the water came from. They couldn't find it anywhere else in the desert. It was here. And yet. Because of this. The Egyptians started to worship the Nile. As a god. It had its own, in fact, there was a whole series of gods that were related to the Nile River. And none of those gods could help. None of those gods responded. Now, Pharaoh looked at this. He's standing there. I can imagine he's getting ready to jump in there. And it doesn't impress him much. So what? So what? This entire life-giving river is now dead. The Bible says that the fish began to die. You say, but they're still in liquid. Yes, but fish need to breathe oxygen just like you and I do. They just process it through the gills. And blood is not made of oxygen. Now it carries oxygen, but blood does not have the oxygen. And so the little fishies that are swimming in there, all of a sudden it turns to blood and the blood get in their gills and they suffocate and they die. Now, I don't know if you've ever been around a big bloody pile, but that coppery smell is an awful smell. And it's now all over. The fish now turn up and they're floating or however they are inside of the blood. The blood itself is beginning to smell. This coppery, awful smell is there. Baking in the sun. Everywhere you go, there is no water. And yet Pharaoh is standing there. So he's already determined he's not going to respond to God. And in order to justify his response. Now he could have responded yes. uh, And not brought the magicians at all. He did not have to test the magicians. Now we see this with teenagers. You know the teenager's favorite question is why. Do you know that the teenager is not interested in why? What they're trying to do is trying to get you to change your mind. Let me prove it. Can I borrow the car? No. Why? They don't care about the explanation. They just want you to. You say, how do you know? Because if I said yes, it'd be pulling out the driveway before I finished the word yes. Right? They would already made a decision that they want their answer. They're not looking for an explanation. Pharaoh had already made a decision of what he was going to do before he called the magicians. He brought the magicians in to back up, to reinforce his decision. Let me tell you why I decided no. And then he brings in the magician. So you understand where this works. He did not say no because the magicians did this. He brought the magicians because he already said no. Does that make sense? We have to understand that. Why in the world do people go back on the internet after the preacher preaches a message? Because they've already decided to say no and they want to go find some reason to justify why I don't have to listen to what the preacher says. People do that. I know you guys don't, but that's good. Please don't do that. But people do that all the time. They find, well, I don't like what the preacher said, so I'm going to find someone else who agrees with me. By the way, Anything that I preach, you can always find the opposite on YouTube. 
You can always find the opposite. I could say that the, the, that the water is wet and you could find some article on the internet that would try to disprove that water is not really wet. And yes, there is an article on there that says that water is not wet. Okay? You understand? Why do people go back on the internet after the preacher preaches? Because they've already made a decision to say no. They're looking at some way to justify them saying no. Does that make sense? That's exactly what Pharaoh is doing. By the way, disobedience leads to a hardened heart. Anytime that you say no to, in response to God's word, your heart begins to harden. It doesn't matter if you find evidence. It doesn't matter if you're trying to get as many people to back you up as possible. The fact is you've already decided to say no, and now you're looking for justification for your decision. And your heart has already begun to get hardened, regardless of what had just happened. So, the magicians come out, verse 22, and the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, neither did he hearken unto them, as the Lord said. Now, the magicians come and they say, oh yeah, it's no big deal, we can turn water into blood too. Well, may I ask a question? Are they helping the problem or hurting it? Because they're not healing it. I mean, if they really wanted to show God, they would cure the water. But they didn't. They made things worse. Because Satan has an imitating power. He imitates. He does not create. In fact, as you go through the plagues, the magicians finally stopped when God began to create lice and flies. We can't do this. This is beyond our thing. Because Satan has an imitating power, not a creating power. And whenever Satan gets involved... His solutions make things worse. They add to the problems. They do not fix them. And so, Pharaoh says, I don't have to obey. See, we can imitate this. Well, thanks for turning more water into blood. (laughs) Good job. You still got a lot of problems. The water is blood still. You haven't fixed that. God's still God. But Pharaoh had decided not to. Verse 23, And Pharaoh turned and went back into his house. Neither did he set his heart to this also. So Pharaoh, man, Pharaoh, by the way, you wouldn't want to get in a game of staring with this guy. I meant a rod turned into a serpent. He didn't flinch. All the water of Egypt turned into blood before his own eyes. He's getting ready to take a bath. He just says, okay, goes back inside. No big deal. Wouldn't you have an issue if you watched all the water turn to blood? Wouldn't you kind of maybe stare a little bit and go, what? Just what? This guy, I meant, this guy is steel. All right, fine, can't get my bath for today. I'm going to go do other stuff. Just walks back inside, no big deal. He's just determined he's not going to respond to God, so he's just not letting it bother him. Walks back inside. But the Egyptians had problems, verse 24. And all the Egyptians digged round about the river to water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the river. Now, Pharaoh goes inside, continues his day. But the rest of the Egyptians, this is a big deal. They need water for their crops. They need water to drink. You can't survive long without water. You need water to do everything, especially out in a desert. So they begin to dig near the riverbank, hoping that underneath there's a pocket of water. Underneath there's something that hasn't been touched. Maybe it's just blood on the top. Maybe we could dig and get to... They started to get desperate and they're digging. And no matter what water source they find, it is all blood. But notice this, verse 25. And seven days were fulfilled after the Lord had smitten the river. For seven days. You think there were some thirsty people by that seventh day? Do you think after seven days, there are people going to talk to Pharaoh themselves and say, Pharaoh, do whatever they say. We need things fixed. Pharaoh, please help. Seven days, people are thirsty. Seven days. This has gone on. And the magicians and all their tricks could do nothing. Seven days, Pharaoh is staring at it and hearing all the problems of Egypt. And he's still saying, I don't care what they say. I don't care what they do. I'm not going to listen to this God. That is a hardened heart. Someone who has already determined he was 
not going to obey God. He had already built up this thing. I will not obey God. Which brings me to the heart of the message here. We saw that Pharaoh's heart was hardened with the rods. Pharaoh's heart was hardened with the blood. But now I want to show you this. Pharaoh's heart was hardened for a reason. Pharaoh's heart was hardened for a reason. Notice, if you don't mind, back to verse number 1. The book of Exodus, chapter 7, and verse number 1. Notice what it says. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. And thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, and he shall send the children of Israel out of the land. Now, notice in verse 1, this is important. God is telling Moses, Moses, you are going to be as if you were God to Pharaoh. Meaning that, that in Pharaoh's sight, Moses, you are the representation of God. That when you speak, it is as if I was there speaking to them directly. And by the way, this principle still applies. That as God has sent his man, and as long as his man is preaching God's word, it is just as if God himself is telling you to obey. And so what this does, it shows that when you disobey the preacher, you're not disobeying the preacher. Your problem's with the Lord. That's who you have a problem with. That's the one. The preacher is just the messenger boy. He's the one that told the message. You deal with him. I was telling a young man about pastoring the other day. And that one of the qualifications of a pastor. Is that you have to be blameless. And that means without handholds. And from a pastor's perspective. The reason is. Is because the people will not like the message from time to time. And so in order to discount the message. They are going to look for something to grab a hold of, of the preacher, to say, I don't have to listen to the preacher because of this in his life. This is why the qualification of a pastor is that he must be blameless. Not perfect, but he has to live his life so people can't grab a hold of it because they're going to. They're going to look for some reason. The reason why I don't listen to my preacher is because he dresses weird. You see how he dresses? I don't need to listen to a man like that. By the way, I've heard that excuse. Well, I don't have to listen to that preacher. He just preaches way too smart. Okay. I remember sitting at a lady's house once and she was sideways with a preacher. And she goes, Pastor. Or she didn't use pastor. Whenever they stop using the word pastor, I know I'm in trouble. Brother Scotty, I just can't listen to you anymore. Because every week you just say you're a liar. And I just can't have a pastor that's a liar. I'm like, what? Every week you say you're, every week you tell everyone you're a liar. I'll go, oh, remember when I give the gospel, I'll say, well, the Bible says in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not bear false witness. Well, I'm a pastor, but I've told a lie. How many of you ever told a lie before? She goes, every week you just say you're a liar. I just can't listen to a pastor who's just a liar. What? <laughs> you understand that she was looking for something. So she didn't have to listen to me. That's the thing. People will always try to get rid of the message by attacking the messenger. But the reality of it is, is it doesn't matter who the messenger is. He's the one who has delivered the, or gave the message. He is the one that people have to deal with. They respond to him. That means it doesn't matter if it's New Year's Eve and we have some of the young men preaching. It doesn't matter if it's my son who opens the Bible. If the Bible is open, we need to respond properly to it. It doesn't matter who the messenger boy is. It matters where the message came from. And every time the Bible is open, we are expected to respond to it as if it was God himself speaking. Meaning that we have to look beyond the instrument and look at the one who caused it. This is what Moses is t uh, being told by God. That when he disobeys you, Moses, he's not disobeying you. He's disobeying me. And the problem that he has is with me. Moses, I'm letting you know that right on. This is what this, this explanation is for. He's trying to tell Moses. Now notice in verse number 3. 
And I, God, will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But God, why don't you just soften his heart and let us leave? Wouldn't that be easier? God, why don't you just kill him and just let us leave? Notice there's a purpose for this. Why doesn't God just kill Pharaoh? Why doesn't God just soften Pharaoh's heart? Can God do that? Yes. Why didn't he? Why didn't he just give Pharaoh a dream and Pharaoh wakes up and says, you know what, I changed mine. Go ahead and go. Why not? Why harden his heart and make him resist it? Which, by the way, Pharaoh had already decided to do. God is just enforcing that. Notice with me in verse number four. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth my armies and the people of Israel uh, and the people, the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Once again, when he's doing the uh, getting ready to turn it to blood. In verse 16, and thou shalt say unto him, the Lord God of Israel shall sit me unto thee, saying, let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. Um, in verse number 17 is where I'm going. Thus saith the Lord, in this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Why is God going about this in this manner? Why? Because... What God is doing is that God has no desire to be the God of a small group of people. God has a desire to be God over the entire world. And he's doing it in such a way that all the world would know, including Pharaoh, that there is a true and living God with much power. I'm so glad that God is not just the God of Riverview Baptist Church. I'm glad that God is just not the God of Baptistic people. I'm glad that God is not just the God of America. But God is a God who wants to be God of all the world. Of all the people. He wants people to recognize that there is a God. And it doesn't matter what type of people you are. Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in His sight. God wants to be a God of all people. And so why is it that God has already allowed... Pharaoh to make his decision and he's reinforced that decision because God wants to prove through all of these hardships there is a God in heaven. You know, sometimes we wish that God would allow things to be easy for us. But we have to look past the circumstances and maybe understand that God is trying to be more than just the God of us. Sure, God can answer some of our little pitily prayers and be the God of us. But his name is not magnified to those who are watching. Sometimes he'll allow hardships to come in our life and watch us trust him. So people around us can say, that God is real. That God is real. Sometimes he can allow us to go through a thing and God prove himself and prove himself and prove himself. And those who are watching the whole time will say, I want to know that God too. God has a bigger picture than what you and I have. To be honest, our picture is short. And if we would be really honest, our picture is me, 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 me. God take care of me, let my life... I don't care about the neighbors really. I mean, we wouldn't say that out loud. But I just want me taken care of. Me taken care of. And God says, there's more in this world than just you. And I want to be more than the God of just one person. I want all of Green Bay, all of Appleton, all of Wisconsin to know there is a God. When you realize that God has a plan and it's much bigger than us, then we'll be a lot more patient when things don't seem to work out for us. I got a flat tire. Why God? Why? Why do you hate me? Because God may be be the God of the tow truck driver as well but god why do i have this medical problems because god may be wanting to be the god of the doctors and the nurses and the orderlies inside of the hospital as well god is a god who wants to be god of everyone can we trust him 
Can we trust him? Yes, we can if we're responding to him properly. So here we have two different things. First of all, our response. Every time we do not respond properly to God's word, our heart hardens even more. Now, with that, let me give you an explanation. That response is always yes. If we say, I will do that later, what you're doing is say, no, God, I will not obey you now. That's already disobedience. Your heart will get hardened. Someone who says, I'll get saved later, what you're doing is saying, I will not get saved now. Some person who says, I'll obey later. What you're saying is, you will not obey now. And your heart will begin to be hardened. God's not in worrying about your intentions. He's seeing about your actions and your obedience. Will you respond now? The second thing we have is the encouragement for us who have responded well. That with God all things are possible. Can you trust him with the circumstances? That God doesn't hate you just because you got a stub toe. Just because it just doesn't seem things are working out your way. But God may have a plan that he wants to use you with to reach other people who are watching your circumstances. Can you trust God? Will you allow God to be more than your God? Will you allow God to be the God of other people as well? Can you trust him. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 five three zero six three oh eight once again that number is nine two zero five three oh six three oh eight if there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you please let us know we would love to make ourselves available thank you